For the past eight years, Deer Systems has been helping business owners, operation and warehouse managers, and sales teams transform their inventory-based businesses. Deer Systems is an inventory management application for e-commerce operators, wholesalers, retailers, and end-to-end manufacturers. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Deer Systems, later in the episode. Any accounts payable app you pick and implement is probably going to save you 70 to 80%, mm-hmm. which is kind of, then you're just like, why are you not using these tools, people? Oh, I know. Right. <laughs> if they, even if you pick the wrong tool, you're probably going to get an ROI. Yeah. It's the lowest hanging fruit in automation. Seriously. That's, and that's why there's so many of these apps now, because it's just, it's, it's, we figured out how to do it as an industry. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Clockchart. Back in October of 2013, I became Clockchart's first Twitter follower. Today, Clockchart has grown to a highly rated and very much loved time tracking app that is now used by over 5,000 small businesses globally. With features like crew tracking, scheduling, overtime notifications, routes, geofencing locations, job costing, budgeting, and reporting, Clockchart has built a robust mobile time tracking app to handle the unique challenges that face your mobile workforce clients. Their technology has been helpful as their clients work through the COVID-19 pandemic. Your clients will need accurate records of their expenses and losses, and technology like Clockchart helps. With Clockchart, your clients can keep accurate records like paid time off and other important data to provide the necessary proof for CARES and FFCRA Act benefits. This lets them get straight back to work without too much disruption after the pandemic has passed. Clockchart standard plan is just six dollars a month per employee. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash clockchart. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C L O C K S H R K. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. I recently had two Zoom calls with accountants that use BQE Core for their professional service clients like architects, engineers, consultants, and lawyers. One accountant called it the missing link for professional services. Another said that BQE Core is the only game in town for job profitability in the cloud. My biggest takeaway from the conversations was how you can 100% use BQA Core as your standalone accounting system or pair it up with either QuickBooks Online or Xero. Either way, you get to take advantage of all the advanced features of BQE Core like adjustment invoicing, budgets, labor costs, forecasting, contract analysis, and approval processes. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Good morning. Blake, how was your week? Morning. Yeah, Yeah, it it was good. My parents are back in town now that it's cooled down here in Arizona. Now, your parents were already in the Phoenix area. Yeah. Now... But they have, their, they have their own place to live. Like they're not living with you now. Uh, they they you bought a house. They split their time between Seattle area and Phoenix area. I call them rainbirds. I don't know if that's a term, but <laughs> that's what I call them. But now that you have your your house, like they're not. They didn't d- dump their house and they moved in with you. No, right? no, so no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just got some, some so, okay. so now we have we have the possibility of date night after you know six months of not going out. I mean, we could actually do it. That's exciting. It's tempting. Yeah. You have the, especially, you know, in the Phoenix area, a lot of places are wide open. Right. You right. Cause it's cool it. now. Like I kept the windows open for the first time last night. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like richer now your wallet? When, yeah. Now that the air conditioning is not running. Yeah. It, it's so, it's so strange. Like everybody is like putting on their sweaters, turning on the fireplace everywhere else in the country. And here we are like opening the windows <laughs> while everyone else is closing them. It's so strange. Even though it's 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 a whole eighty five degrees, but it feels super cold because you're still dressing like it's one hundred and twenty degrees. You're like I, I probably should put socks on now. Yeah, and maybe yeah, yeah. you know, be a second <laughs> shirt of some type. Oh, that's good. Uh, Friday, we had interesting experience. So we had a little party for our beta users for Melio, and we used the new hop- platform called Hopin. Oh yeah, I and it's that. like a conference platform. Oh, you have used yeah. it. Okay, yeah, we used it at AcuityCon. This year. Okay, it was kind of it was cool. Like I, I liked uh, some of the people really liked the networking and going back and forth. The only thing that that kind yeah. of um, was a bummer on it. As soon as we tried to have too many people in the session, had their cameras up, it just couldn't handle the volume. Mm. Which is kind of a testament to Zoom, right? It's amazing that Zoom can have 110 people in the platform and the video and audio still seems to work. Yeah, that right. That was always the thing that blew me away. It's like the simultaneous video streams on Zoom. Like, how do they do that? The technology for that. 
amazing. But yes. And they do it really well. The only bad part of it was is they also hop in at the end, they just kick you out. Like conference is over. Like there's no even as the uh administrator or moderator, there's no like, hey, do you need 15 more minutes? Oh. <laughs> and they just booted everybody out. Um but it was interesting because everybody's beta testers, right? So everybody like instantly right. signed right back in. <laughs> That's great. So so one thing also I noticed about Hopin, I'm not sure if this is something you can control on the administrator side, is the the video recording of the sessions. When people are showing their video and screen sharing at the same time, it just shows it in a uh, grid. And so you can't actually see anything on their screen share because it's so small in the video. Oh, so instead of putting you as a, a teeny box in the corner and have your screen share be the majority of the screen. Right. If it's just screen sharing you, it's 50-50. If it's four people in there, it's split up 25. Ah, I see. So, okay. So if you get seven or eight people, the screen share is small. You can't – even if there's one person was showing their video while they're screen sharing, it doesn't work. So anyway, little things like that, right, that make you appreciate Zoom. For those who don't know, Zoom has the ability to record all the different video streams separately, the the screen share separately, so that the video you get, you can actually edit and make into something usable. It'll be interesting to see, like you said, since Zoom has figured out how to do it, just having multiple people stream their video all at the same time, where if services like Hopin would just use some sort of Zoom. That's what they should the do. Covers, right? You know, that would be great if they just like layered it, but... It was nice, though, to try to do a different experiment to bring people together instead of just doing another Zoom call. So, yes. Should we well, jump in the news? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Zoom. Zoom is critical to remote work. So, I thought I would share this bit of news about a big company that is trying to figure out what they're going to do after coronavirus and the pandemic end. Because a lot of these big companies have said, work from home until X date whether that's January of 2021 or June or July of 2021. But we still don't know what's going to happen after that. Are people going to go back to the office 100% of the time? Are they going to stay remote? Twitter has said they're letting everyone work remotely forever. I think I just saw Microsoft said the same. So Microsoft, this is the story that I wanted to highlight. Oh, how could they're, what a great transition by me. I didn't even know. Well done. They're compromising. They are saying that employees can work from home half the time after January. 2021. Obviously, they're still going to have to stay in a, an area where they can access the office because they have to come in, but half the days they can stay at home. And they're referring to their new policy as a, quote, hybrid model, unquote. So not the all-encompassing permanent work from home rule that other tech companies such as Twitter are going to implement. So I have a question on this. And just because I've experienced this myself um, when I was at it. And a lot of people in the Bay Area tend to work from home on Fridays. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, I stopped having my business trips go there on a Friday because you would go there and you'd be in the office and everybody would be working from home. So if people are doing this part-time, unless you like require people to, hey, everybody's in the office Mondays and Tuesdays and then tour from home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, aren't you just going to create situations where you're driving into the office just to do Zoom calls with people that are at home, which kind of defeats the whole purpose? Well, and that's what ends up happening in a big campus anyway a lot of the time. You end up doing Zoom calls because it's more convenient than all getting together in a conference room. So it might take you 15 minutes to walk to the conference room. Yep. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's any like practical reason for this other than they want to maintain their in-person culture and still have people accessible like geographically. I, I think that's a big reason for it is like when, when you do need to get together, you can quickly. So you don't want people going too far away. Yeah. And there's something to be said about in person getting together like oh yeah th that has to occur A absolutely like my favorite work schedule personally is mondays fridays at home tuesday through thursday in the office tuesday wednesday thursday maybe you don't go in wednesday one day you know it can be flexible but i like that midweek get together for the meetings that you need to have in person and then let everybody like get their work done on mondays because on Mondays are terrible for meetings anyway, right? You should, people shouldn't do meetings on Monday because you got you got work to do. You got your email inbox full. You got to get heads down. Let people focus. Do your meetings during the midweek. And also, people are on vacation a lot of the time on Mondays and Fridays because they you know take an extra day right, for a long weekend. So then you end up having to reschedule all those meetings anyway. Especially with everybody working remotely, people are in different time zones, right? Yeah. And exactly. sometimes you're, you're you're crawling out of bed, getting on a Zoom call for a meeting, and you're not really prepared. But you're right. By Wednesday, everybody's Kind of in the swing of things. Yeah. 
everybody will be prepared for the meeting. People will have actually gotten work done to actually report on their progress for the meeting. Yeah. I can, I can, I can argue for Wednesday only meetings. Oh, the worst are like Monday morning status meetings because you know that means that you have to get on your computer Sunday night to make sure that you know what you're talking about on, on Monday morning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Like, why not just do it Tuesday or Wednesday? Anyway, yeah, that's the Microsoft deal. Uh, I think it's a good compromise. Like, that's hybrid is probably the best way to go and probably would work really well for accounting firms and bookkeeping firms too, I think. Now, the question is, where do we go from here in the show? Because I have a bunch of app news as usual. Oh, we've got PPP news. Yeah, I have lots of app news. I have a little bit of sales tax news. Mm -hmm. And then um, I guess PPP. Now, maybe you could confirm, you being the CPA. Uh Uh-oh. I saw the headline. Yeah. It feels like any loans that are fifty thousand dollars or less are now getting rubber stamped forgiveness. So, can you clarify as a CPA on this? So, when I saw the headline, which is in the Journal of Accountancy, PPP forgiveness simplified for loans of fifty thousand dollars or less. That's what I thought too, but then I dug into it, and no, not really. Accounting Today had a story that quoted Heather Bain, chair of the Small Business Committee of the Institute of Management Accountants and the owner of Bain CPA Business Strategies in Houston. And Heather Bain explains that actually, because most of the loans under $50,000, those companies didn't have a lot of employees. They Maybe they had one employee or no employees. Uh, these, these rule changes don't really help that much because all it's changing is how much the loan forgiveness amount is reduced based on reductions in full-time equivalent employees or reductions in employee salary or wages. So part of the problem with the PPP loans is you know, they were designed to penalize people who laid people off, right? The whole point was paycheck protection program. So if you're an employer and you take the money, you're supposed to keep people on payroll for that uh, period of time that the loan covered, the original eight weeks or now 24 weeks, And you're supposed to spend that money on salaries. That's the whole idea. I mean, simplified vastly, right? So if you laid people off and you took the money, you would get penalized and you would have to reduce the amount that you could get forgiven that would turn into a grant. So that's what they've done with these loans for under $50,000 is if you took a loan for less than that and you did reduce salaries or employee wages or whatever, now you don't have to worry about that. But everything else is still the same. So you still got to apply for forgiveness. You still got to fill out the paperwork. And here's what Heather Bain has to say about it. Quote, there weren't really that many changes. In fact, the whole rule only reduced the complexities for calculating full-time equivalents and the reduction in wages. That's it. The rule even says that doesn't really apply to the majority of those loans that were under 50,000. That's why they're allowed the de minimis rule in the first place. I don't think we're going to see that many businesses benefit from that rule. And what most of my clients and companies that I work with have said is that they were hoping for an automatic forgiveness where you don't have to wait to find out for sure if you're going to get forgiveness. And that was not part of the interim final rule. So so basically, if I'm hearing this correctly, if I had a loan under $50,000, I probably didn't have much work to do anyways for the normal application. So now they've given me a different application and it's probably the equal amount of work to fill it out. It's not It's not going to save you that much time. Uh, and it probably wouldn't have applied to you anyway. The, the thing that's changing, which has to do with reduction in you know wages and salaries, probably didn't apply to the smaller loan amounts anyway. So should people continue to wait? Because I do see there's a quote from uh, Steve Mnuchin here. So he said that we are committed to making PPP forgiveness process as simple as possible while protecting against fraud and misuse of funds. We continue to favor additional legislation to further simplify the forgiveness process. So he's implying that they want to push for more legislation that's going to make this easier. So should everybody just still wait? I mean, why not? You've got until the end of the year to do it. So wait until December, at least. (laughs) Who knows what could happen in November, right? After the election, maybe that reduces the logjam in Congress and they just pass something to get it done with on the way out, you know, if there's a regime change. Yep, that's it for PPP. Nothing too exciting there. Uh, I do have some exciting fraud-related news. So two big stories here. So remember how we talked about the NRA being under investigation by the New York Attorney General? expense reports, right? Fake expense reports. Yeah, so they were... Wayne LaPierre is the head of the NRA. He was having the advertising agency pay a bunch of expenses that were not like legit expenses, you know, trips to Europe and stuff, and then uh, bill the NRA for the amount. So it it looked like a legitimate expense because it was being laundered essentially 
by this advertising agency. That's the accusation by the New York Attorney General anyway. Not too sophisticated, but easy, easy to pull off. Now the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, is investigating Wayne LaPierre personally for possible criminal tax fraud related to his personal taxes. That is, according to the Wall Street Journal, the reason he's under investigation personally by the IRS now is that if that scheme that the New York Attorney General accuses uh, happened, then that's undisclosed compensation because it you know, were personal expenses that Wayne LaPierre should have disclosed on his personal income tax return and paid taxes on. So it could be millions of dollars of basically income that he hid, and that's bad. He can go to jail for that for quite a long time. So free yacht trips, private jet flights, exotic safaris. I think this is going to be pretty juicy when this all comes out. It'll be interesting to see what the actual expenses were, and we're, we're going to get to see that. And the second story I have is possibly even more crazy. Software pioneer John McAfee has been indicted on tax charges. He has been charged with tax evasion and willful failure to file tax returns. That's the word from the Department of Justice uh, after unsealing a June 15th, 2020 indictment following McAfee's arrest in Spain, where he is pending extradition. You know who McAfee is, right? John McAfee. We all know that. Yeah, name, I mean, but... he's kind of been uh, off the grid, off the radar, out there a little bit on the on the crazy scale for the last 15 years. Because I think Intel bought McAfee for like $7 billion. And then he like, I think he bought a bunch of artwork. They sold the artwork. Then he bought, he, he's been all over the board on stuff, right? He's pump, pump and dumping stocks now. He, he's... John McAfee, he got super rich from his antivirus software that we probably all had installed on our PCs at some point. And so after he sold his company to Intel, you know, he's always been kind of an outspoken person. He, he really you know, became a global traveler. He said he was going to run for president, right? We're in, we're in <laughs> Kanye West territory here. He actually had a Twitter account for that purpose. He describes himself as like a globe-trotting adventurer. Get this, in 2012, he was on the run in Belize, wanted by police as part of an investigation for the murder of his neighbor, Gregory Fall. McAfee was sought by police for questioning, but instead fled the country. He was eventually found in Guatemala, and after a brief detention sent back to the United States, he has denied any involvement in the murder. I, I feel like I watched a documentary about that. Yeah, I think there was something on TV about that, yeah. But He's all like on the beach with his ETCs and it's a very interesting guy. <laughs> but the back to the taxes. Okay. Yes, not murder. Back to taxes. So apparently he has been very vocal about not paying taxes, declaring on Twitter in 2019, quote, I have not paid taxes for eight years. I have not filed returns. Every year I tell the IRS, I am not filing a return. I have no intention of doing so. Come and find me, unquote. Well, they did come and find him. Again, he's in Spain, pending extradition. I guess he just said, I'm not going to pay taxes. And you know, he's earned millions of income promoting cryptocurrencies, doing consulting work, speaking engagements. He sold the rights to his life story for a documentary. That must have been the one you watched. And yeah, from 2014 to 2018, he just refused to file tax returns. And of course, I think we all know in the accounting world, here in the United States, that the U.S. taxes your global income regardless of where you live. So if you, if you don't file those tax returns, you know, going to Belize or Spain isn't gonna isn't gonna solve that problem. Well, it's good to see the IRS is like you know tracking somebody down. I'm sure the list is huge. Yeah. Right. But well, they're, but they're not. But he also brings it on itself, right? He he he's calling him out. Like he invites it. Well, and that's the thing. It's like if he just didn't ask to get caught, maybe he wouldn't because the IRS has admitted. It admitted to Congress uh, very recently, in the last few months, that the IRS doesn't have the resources to audit most of rich most rich people. They, according to a ProPublica story called "Sorry, but it's just easier to cheaper to audit the poor." The IRS audits the working poor at about the same rate as the wealthiest one percent. There were three hundred eighty thousand audits of low income taxpayers last year, which is thirty nine percent of the total. And the IRS essentially admitted in a report to Congress that it's easier to audit poor taxpayers and that budget cuts have made it hard to audit the rich. They just don't have enough skilled we've auditors. We've talked about that. Yeah, we've talked about that before on the podcast. And um, you know, this was in response to a senator who was complaining about this. And the IRS said, we don't have a plan. We're not going to have one until the agency uh, gets more funding from Congress. And I think we have reported that the IRS funding has been cut. Democrats have blamed Republicans for the cuts to the IRS enforcement budget. And 
I, I think this is just a really good example of how Starve the Beast, that concept, uh, the Grover Norquist philosophy of you know budget cuts will then result in government agency efficiency improvements because they'll have to make more with less. They'll have to do more with less. That doesn't really work for the IRS. And you have said many times, David, that if this were a private company, there's no way that you would make your revenue generating agency suffer like this. You'd invest, you'd, you'd be doubling down. Right. You'd invest even more in the IRS. Yeah. Yeah. So, so apparently you have to be as stupid as McAfee to get caught, you know, if he just stayed under the radar. <laughs> so, so, so what's the problem here? Like ultimately they don't have the budget. So then you can't hire super talented tax people to perform these audits, right? And figure out where they're. There could be deception. Yeah. I don't know, right? Yeah. But in the meantime, like obviously somebody – and I'm just going to throw Trump out there because it was in the news, whatever, right? He obviously is, hire, is paying top dollar for his accountants and bookkeepers. Right. Or, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so you have a tax well, well, why would you go work for the IRS, you know, paying you a crappy salary to audit Donald Trump when you can go work for his accounting firm and help him avoid taxes legally by manipulating the law or maybe even stretching it too much, right? Uh, and it's easy to stretch because – you know that on the other side, you're not dealing with very sophisticated auditors. You know, they, they, they can't keep up with you. So this is the problem. Uh, one more IRS story before we move on. Remember that mail backlog that the IRS was dealing with because their offices were shut down. They had millions of pieces of mail. Oh, it was just like stacked up in a yeah. storage facility type things. Yeah. So last week, Commissioner Charles Reddig told Congress that the mail backlog has been cut in half. It's now at 5.3 million pieces of mail. That's about half what it was a few months ago. Still sounds like a lot to me, though. The IRS is using multiple shifts, overtime pay, and mail shipments to less stressed facilities to whittle that down. Maybe if they had more staff, they could get through it, right? And regarding stimulus payments, believe it or not, they are still trying to pay 8 million people, mostly those who don't typically file tax returns, which includes prisoners. Apparently, the IRS decided that they weren't going to send stimulus payments to incarcerated people, but the bill actually doesn't say anything about that in the CARES Act. So they're entitled to them. And there was actually a judge that ruled in California that said, no, you actually have to send the payments to prisoners. You can't just leave them out because you choose to. So that probably is a good chunk of the people that they haven't paid yet. Now, about to get the inner prison economy going. I guess so, yeah. But to give them some credit, they have made 160 million payments this year, totaling more than 270 billion dollars. So, you know, they're 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 wrapping up the loose ends here, but you know, it's kind of crazy to think that here we are in October, mid-October, and we still don't have the original $1200 stimulus payments out to everybody. And that was what in March, April? I can't even remember when that happened, when that was I mean, passed. basically all of, co if you want to call it COVID season or whatever, right? The entire COVID period, these checks have been being mailed out and people still have yet to get them. Which is a great reason why we need a digital dollar so that, you know, the IRS can just inject this money into people's bank accounts. Or their Robinhood account. <laughs> Did you ask you what happened at Robinhood now? Again, so, Robinhood's the news. So I saw some news about how people have had their accounts drained and haven't been able to reach anyone because Robinhood doesn't have a phone number? Yeah. So there's a, a potential hacking incident. So Robinhood is a newer online brokerage. They don't really charge fees or it's super, it's relatively almost, it's almost free, right? It's relatively cheap on their fees. Yeah. It's super, it's, I think they make money on the, um, some like interchange kind of rate. So. And, and it's set up to be very addictive uh, it's very like point driven and compared to your friends and it's, it, it's, it's really made it like, uh, the farmville of stock trading, right. Instead of it just being an app. It's like a, it's like a game on your phone. Uh, my brother is into this and he's like made 50% on his trades over, over the coronavirus period. For everybody who's, who's, who's done that, there's stories of people that have lost, right? right? right. And then they, they broke in SEC rules and like, they've just had one mishap after another. They had those outages, those two, uh, those two days, the market completely full, uh, collapsed. Mm -hmm. I think, remember they were out, they had outages, they were down. Yep. And so there's just been one thing after another. So now the latest is, um, there's reports that something happened with people's accounts have been hacked. And so Robinhood stated that the company's internal systems were not compromised and that they're, quote unquote, actively working with those impacted to secure their accounts. Hmm. 
And a lot of account holders, so this is uh, according to Bloomberg, they've, they've spoken to uh, Robinhood account holders who said they sought help from the brokerage only to receive a response that stated, quote unquote, we understand the sensitivity of your situation and will be escalating the matter to our fraud investigations team. Please be aware that this process may take a few weeks and the team is working on your case and won't be able to provide constant updates. That's, uh, that would not be encouraging if you know money's draining out of my account because it's been hacked. And I'm trying to get somebody on the phone. So, and this is, you know, the the stacks up, and they've had lawsuits already before yeah. in the past. Like, if I had a, like, if I had to bet money, like, Robinhood's going to be the next big tech collapse, right there with Theranos. Uh, well, I, I don't know about that. I uh, mean, we work where, where it's going to. It'll probably be acquired by, you know, one of the big historically big firms like a JP Morgan Chase or something like that. That will, as an exchange, like, okay, we'll get them to comply to the. SEC rules and yeah, I, I, I'm curious to know exa- exactly what's going on here because a lot of times with these cases, it's the email linked to your account gets hacked, and then the hackers are able to set send the reset codes to your email. And if you don't have multi factor authentication set up, that's all they have to do. They just hack your email, and they can reset your password and drain your account. So you know this this is by design because it's easy to use. People, people are willing to put up with no service, bad service for free. I mean, it's putting pressure on the, the historical normal brokerages to come down in price and compete at this price point. They've all gone free too. Uh-huh. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Whenever anyone questions like, why is Robinhood so successful? I say, well, have, when was the last time you tried to make a trade with your traditional brokerage mobile app? Okay. I tried to sell some bonds. I use uh, Merrill Edge, at Bank of America. I tried to sell some bonds using their mobile app. I'm a tech expert. I would would you call me a technology expert, David? I think that's fair, right? I mean, you 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 know how these things work, right? You, it's not your first time using an app, right? Right. I have broad experience with many different apps, both financial and accounting. I could not figure out how to do it. I had to go on the the desktop app on the website to do it, and it still was really hard. So, like all Robinhood has done is actually make it easy to make trades. You know, I had the uh... Morgan Stanley app. I was trying to move money from one account to my actual checking account that had nothing to do with, you know, Morgan Stanley. Yeah. And it just kept going to this other account on Morgan Stanley. I couldn't get the funds transferred out. It was like this loop. Yeah. The, yeah. the app was too confusing to me. Yeah. I, I totally get your point. I mean, like, seriously, like, there's no, there's no wonder that Robinhood is successful given how bad these other traditional brokerages are. It's just, it's just so bad. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Deer Systems. For many of you, the pandemic economy has caused your brick and mortar clients to either remain closed for months or pivot to becoming an omni-channel seller or distributor. If your clients have had to evolve into managing an e-commerce operation and have found their old pre-pandemic inventory solutions just aren't cutting it, you should check out Deer Systems. Deer is a true cloud-based perpetual inventory system with actual cost calculations based on international accounting standards. It helps accurately manage stocks across various sales channels, marketplaces such as Amazon, physical retail stores, and multiple warehouses. It can handle manufacturing processes from contract manufacturing to full enterprise-level production runs, all tied in with a dual sync to Zero and QuickBooks. As I was digging into Deer's website to create this ad, it quickly became apparent that there just isn't enough room in this ad to mention everything that Deer includes. So let me rattle this off. EDI, B2B ordering, e-commerce sites, point of sale, resource and production plan, automation, reporting, dashboards, and shipping. To get your client a 30% discount for six months, use code CAP2020 when signing up for Deer Systems by December 31st, 2020. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Deer. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash D-E-A-R. Connect all your sales channels with Deer. We've talked about the micro consumer loans and payday loans. Mm -hmm. Well, Bank of America is now coming down into that market. So Bank of America announced that they're going to have a new short-term loan program called Balance Assist, aimed at customers needing with a few hundred dollars to make ends meet. So you're able to get up to $500 in increments of $100 for a flat fee of $5. And then you pay it in three equal installments over three months. So the, obviously the pressure of all these insta-pay, payday mm, loan places, yeah. putting pressure on the big banks. And this is actually encouraged by the government. Five regulatory agencies put pressure on the big banks. 
And they said that they need to start doing these small loans hmm. to direct attack on the payday loan industry, essentially. So, so that's interesting because we were talking about Gusto in a previous episode and how they now have this cash out feature, Gusto cash out, yep. where employees, instead of taking a payday loan, they can basically get an advance on their paycheck. And Gusto put out a blog post announcing that and their Gusto wallet feature, which I think we've talked about this, but it has, it was like in beta or, you know, maybe not formally announced, but, but anyway, they're, they're really going out to market with this now. So well, that's what you said, like every, every payroll app should just give employees a bank account. Right, right. Yeah. So we did talk about this. So now every Gusto employee automatically gets a cash account and they can have money put into that cash account, like basically like a bank account in, in the Gusto app. Uh, set aside. You can put the whole amount. You can put part of it. You can set savings goals. It now earns uh, savings uh, interest, so it gets 0.34 percent, which is doesn't sound like a lot, but it's eight times the national savings rate. Uh, you pair that with cash out, which is that ability to get a small amount, a portion of your paycheck in advance, and that's like dynamically calculated by Gusto based on how much you've been paid in the past. They'll advance you the money and take it out of your paycheck. And finally, the last thing they have added, this is really neat. They now have health reimbursement benefits through QSE HRA, Qualified Small Employer Health Reimbursement Arrangements. So this is a type of health insurance arrangement that small employers can opt into where employers can reimburse employees through Gusto, through the payroll system for insurance that they purchase directly. So employees find and choose their own eligible insurance plans, and then employers can reimburse them for it, which is really neat because normally that sort of arrangement is not allowed. I know a lot of employers end up doing it. They'll have employees go and buy insurance on the health exchanges, you know, the Obamacare exchanges, and then reimburse them. You're not supposed to do that. That's against the rules, and you can be fined a lot of money. But apparently you can do that through this QSE HRA, and Gusto now supports that. It's actually a great option, and then they say it's a great option when people are going remote because if you have employees like all over the country, it can be really difficult to set up a small employer health plan when you have employees in multiple states. So this could be a good way to to do it. So that's Gusto's new feature, but uh, the one I really want to talk about is Expensify. I thought this was a, a big announcement. The fact that they're now doing bill pay. Did you see that announcement? Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Like which. Makes a lot of sense given that uh, Expensify's main line of business, which is uh, expense reports, are probably not getting filled out quite as much now that people aren't traveling, right? I think they probably took a big hit. So they worked really hard, I guess, over the last six months or so, and they have now introduced free vendor bill pay. So vendors send their invoices to an email address. Everybody gets a dedicated email address for their account. And then Expensify will automatically scan the bills, present them to the accounting and finance department for approval, and then cut the vendor a check automatically from the Expensify user's business bank account, syncing the whole process with the user's accounting software. So possible competitor to, you know, in, the, in the bill pay space. Yeah. So I think it's, it's interesting. Um... Dave Barrett, the founder, so he sent out he, – he, whenever they do announcements, Expensify likes to send a nice – Detailed email. And there's one part of it that I think is complete BS. The, he, he, so I'll just quote him. A little known fact is that Expensify was never intended to be an expense reporting company. It was always intended to be a platform for all things accounts payable and receivable, said David Barrett in a newsletter to customers. I have to like kind of call BS on that a little <laughs> bit because, I mean, I've known Expensify for a very long time, right? We're very familiar with the platform. We know about the app. I mean, in fact, like way back in the very beginning days of the Intuit partner, but it was called the, the Intuit a QuickBooks API at one time was called like the Intuit partner platform and Expensify and uh, did a presentation. I did a presentation, view my paycheck at the same time. Like, so way back, like we're going back in the days, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it's ever was intended. What I think is you have likes of Divi, Brex, yes. Team Pay. You have all these other players that are basically combining. They look at it as a full blown expense management, right? Or purchase to procure process or whatever, right? And so you have, they have a lot of competitors that are chipping away at their space. And so they had no choice but to do this, uh, regardless of what they ever intended or say they intended. <laughs> they basically had to do this or die because all their, all the big competitors that are going after their same space are now offering bill pay. Yep. And this goes back to what we've talked about, you know, before this, everybody's getting in each other's lanes. 
I, I would not be surprised if somebody like Bill.com offers expense reporting. There's no reason why they couldn't, right? It's just an interface on a bill pay. I mean, people use Bill.com for a crappy version of expense reporting where, you know, you have your uh, employees fill out an Excel sheet, create a bill essentially, and then email it to Bill.com to get reimbursed. And then you have, you know, people coding all the line items in it. Yes. Oh, that's a hack. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it done and it's uh, super inefficient, but it works, right? I, I think what's interesting about this, where if I look at some like a Brex and a Divi and others who have to, they're still trying to get into small businesses and get into some enterprises. Expensify is already in. Right. Millions of businesses. Um, and, and they got in because they always appealed to employees, right? They, they solve for the employees, the employees pain of filing expense reports versus a mid-level manager's tracking of expenses, right? So they, they always, it was always flipped the equation. So do they have a good foothold in lots of companies? So now if you're already using Expensify, but you don't have a bill payment platform, like why would you not just flip a switch and turn this on and start using it? Well, and the devil's in the details though, right? What kind of approval process is there going to be in here? A lot of businesses need multiple layers of approvals. You need different flows. I mean, there's, there's, there's no screenshots. It was like four bullets on a, on a, like on, a, on their website. Like there's no real behind the scenes other than they did send out separate emails that gave you your email address to email bills in. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see how it works. But, you know, they've already got the approval process for the expense reports in there. So if you just take the same thing, right? Think of it as the bill becomes the expense report, and then that's what you're approving and reimbursing. That could and then they, they already had their scanning of receipts, but yeah. scanning the receipts and bills are a little bit different. Because I think for receipts and reimbursable stuff, in many cases, you don't need all the line items. They need to be tracked to jobs and classes and all of that type of stuff. But when it comes to scanning bills, it's a different game. Mm -hmm. And this is still where, why, you know, in a bill workflow, you almost really need an auto entry, a receipt bank, a hub doc. Right. It's the line items. The, the line items, the line items are the tricky part. Yeah. So, so, yeah. We will see where that winds up. Staying with accounts payable. Uh, to Palti, who also does accounts uh, payable automation. So they just uh, had another $150 million raise and for a $2 billion valuation. And, and they're a little bit more upmarket, yeah, yeah. right? Because they're, they're, they're targeting mid-sized to large companies. But that interesting stats, mid-sized to large companies spend around 500 person hours a year just on accounts payable chores. And 27% of the people that they've tracked their survey spend up to a thousand over 1,000 hours. Yeah, massive amount of time wasted on traditional accounts payable uh, in large enterprises. Yeah. And they say they can automate about 80% of the manual work traditionally. And that's probably true for any, like if, if any accounts payable app you pick and implement is probably going to save you 70 to 80%, mm -hmm. which is kind of, then you're just like, why are you not using these tools, people? Oh, I know. Right. <laughs> Even if you pick the wrong tool, you're probably going to get an ROI. Yeah. It's the lowest hanging fruit in automation. Seriously. That's and that's why there's so many of these apps now because it's just it's it we figured out how to do it as an industry. And, um, and Topalti has like big players. I mean, they have Twitter uses them, Uber's using them, GitLab's using them. So they 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 are very very upmarket. Well, speaking of like duh areas where you can implement automation, let's talk about sales tax and our favorite uh, giant sales tax automation provider Avalara. They have acquired transaction tax resources for $377 million. This comes on the heels of their acquisition of Comply, which provides compliance services, technology, and software to producers, distributors, and importers of alcoholic beverages that we spoke about. So what is transaction tax resources, though? They are headquartered in Oregon, and they offer information on U.S. sales and use tax rates, laws, software, and customer support to some of the largest and most complex companies and their internal tax teams. So if you're a Fortune 500 company, if you're a, a big business with complex sales and use tax questions, you subscribe to transaction tax resources and you get a combination of guides, a, a searchable database of sales tax knowledge and actually you also get access to people who can help you interpret what's happening and figure out what you need to do so you're a director of tax for a big company you subscribe to this service just this i think this is similar to how you know you might subscribe to like uh you know a, a tax service uh for you know income tax or corporate tax or whatever yeah well, what's interesting about this acquisition is the customers it's bringing in they have about 1,400 customers, but it's 30% of the Fortune 500. Yeah. 
and they include the largest or second largest company in 40 different industries. And for example, nine of the top 10 healthcare companies, eight of the top 10 telecommunications, and five of the top 10 IT service firms. Now, what's interesting about this to me is I look at as Avalara, I would argue in my brain, Avalara was always a tech company. They were a software company. They were a tech company. And now they're kind of moving to like this more of the services because they actually also bought uh, an AI technology that would go and aggregate tax information. And then obviously they got now into the alcohol and beverage with Comply and now this acquisition. Are they starting to become a little bit more like a technology acquirer in, in, in the same vein as a Thomson Reuters or a Sage where they just are going to own a lot? They're going to own a space. But it's not going to be, it's not really going to be Avalara just with awesome, all these add-on features. It's just going to be like, you have Avalara that we've always known about. And then you subscribe, you pay for this, you pay for this, pay for this. Next, you know, you're buying seven or eight products all from Avalara in the same way you would with Thompson Reuters or with you know, yeah. Sage type thing. I, I would argue the difference is that Avalara is very focused on that, you know, salt, sales, mm -hmm. use tax, local tax, right? All that stuff. What I, What I see here happening is that you can't just give people software when it comes to complex issues like this. You have to give them knowledge too, so that they can actually use it correctly. And so that's what this is about. It's about building up that database of knowledge and adding in consultants who can help people implement Avalara correctly. So software plus a service, if you, if you think about it that way. And that's, that's what these, these bigger companies especially really need. And there just aren't enough consultants who know this stuff for, you know, for Avalara to like just outsource it. Yeah. And I think it makes more sense in the situation where it is, like you said, in this, in the niche of just salt. Yeah. Right. Cause, and to try to do this, they bought a company years ago that was all about like business formation documents and it just never went anywhere. Like it just, they, that company was good at providing these documents and documenting what you need to do to open a business in every single state, but it just never fit back into the Intuit family yeah. very well, right? And then it just kind of got neglected. But like, if this is your only niche, because any work that TTR does, Avalara is going to benefit from it, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, it's going to roll up from their expertise. And did you happen to mention how much this uh, was for? Uh, $377 million. And an all cash deal. All right? cash no. deal. Yeah. There's like a two year buyout provision. So I have in relation to sales tax. I have an unnamed app we could talk about. Okay. <laughs> so I went deep diving on this a little bit. There's an accounting error in Georgia that cost two hundred and forty million dollars. Two hundred and forty million dollars to who? To hit to the bank account of the Georgia's Department of Revenue. Oh, so the state's Department of Revenue. Okay. What what happened? So uh, taxes were misallocated between all the counties, right? And the, and the other municipalities, right? And basically, they tr it's tracked all back in this memo. They basically said that they're using accounting software that misallocated taxes between late 2015 and early 2018. So, so about a three-year period, taxes, business, some software, accounting software, businesses were using to file and track these taxes and then remit the payments, was calculating it wrong for basically three years. Okay, so businesses in the state of Georgia were using this unnamed accounting software to file their sales taxes. It doesn't have to be the state of Georgia right now, but Nexus, uh -oh. right? They could be anywhere. Okay, so businesses all over the country potentially were using this software to file their taxes with Georgia's Department of Revenue for sales taxes. And the yeah. software was calculating stuff incorrectly, which caused a shortfall in their revenue that like they didn't collect enough. Yeah. So the wow. uh, deputy deputy revenue commissioner Jessica Simmons she put out a, a memo this last week, and she and just a quote unquote she said all of the companies use the same tax accounting software that contain this error, causing significant amounts of payments to be incorrectly attributed to state sales tax. Oh no! Well, we got to find out what what company was this? What so, software so I package? Reached on, I reached out on Twitter. Right. I would love for them to say, like, what package is this? Well, um, if you're a listener see, and you know, you got to let us know. Tell us, tell us who, who made this mistake. Yeah, we have to have a listener that knows this. Like, it's got, words got to get out yeah. um, really quickly. I mean, it's either a big name like Intuit that's going to impact many, right? If this is it QuickBooks, yeah. or it's going to be a smaller package that's really enterprise level, right? And it was these huge dollar figures. Well, at $240 right? million. So if it's a small company that made that error, that could put them out of business. Yeah. And then I think the the interesting thing, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's a bigger app like a QuickBooks because it went undetected for so long. 
it was a, a little bit off, a little bit off, a little bit off. Uh, maybe. You know, where people maybe. didn't notice the didn't notice it business to business to business to business versus it was a big enterprise yeah. and they're paying like they would probably figure out and be like, wait a second, why are we paying this much to the state and we're not paying anything to the other munis- municipalities? Gotcha. And so it completely overstated how much money they thought they had. So it's a quarter billion dollars that they have to redistribute now wow. to local governments who are prior, like it's a windfall. <laughs> At this point, probably, yeah, right. Well, um, speaking of errors, I've got an Excel error story. Another one out of the UK. They just can't figure out how to use Excel properly. Remember we had that story about the hospital? I think that was also in the UK where they they had a copy-paste error. They they had to rename genetic genes, right? Because That was worldwide. They had to rename some human genes because the Excel formatting was causing them to be reformatted as dates. And there was like no easy way to turn that off. (laughs) So they ended up renaming the human genome rather than deal with the Excel issue. And then there was the hospital in the UK where they had to redo the ventilation systems in the children's wing, the ICU, because they didn't have enough changes of the air per hour. And there's like a requirement of That's right. 10. The, the and, calculation was done well before. Yeah. And they, they basically that. copy pasted from one column to another and got it wrong. So then they had to redo all that and that cost lots of money. So now Public Health England has admitted that the agency underreported COVID-19 infections by 15,841 cases in recent days due to a, quote, technical issue, unquote. So what is the technical issue? Well, it turns out that they have been using Excel to collect uh, and pull data together from different systems. So there's actually multiple explanations for how this happened. And I'm going to go with the BBC's explanation. So apparently... PHE, this health agency, had set up an automatic process to pull data together into Excel templates so that it could be uploaded into a central system and made available to the National Health Service test and chase stream, test and trace team, say that five times fast, as well as government computer dashboards. So they're collecting information from different hospitals as CSV files and then automating the join of it. The problem is that the developers picked an old file format to do this known as XLS, not the newer this is the newer one, Excel SX, I think. I think so, yeah. So the old format, each template can only handle about 65,000 rows of data rather than the 1 million plus rows that Excel is actually capable of. And since each test result created several rows of data, in practice, it meant that each template was limited to 1,400 cases. When that total was reached, further cases were simply left off. So, so they just thousands and thousands of lines of data have just were never brought in. Right, 15,000 cases. Uh, and, and so the implication... Where the impact is that not only did they miss out reporting those cases at the end of September and in early October, but they didn't trace those cases. In the UK, they are actually trying to do test and trace, unlike here. And so they they didn't call those people because they didn't know about them. So this is the problem with Excel. I mean, it's very powerful. You can write a macro, you can do this automation, but sometimes you know you don't notice these unintended consequences. You miss some COVID-19 cases. So real world impact of Microsoft Excel, uh, you know, automation failing there. But this is this is quality assurance, right? People have cut back so much on quality assurance across the board, and, and that the, the, those are very boundary tests. You know, it's it's the second day two of some QA testers testing, right? They'll kind of test the happy pass on day one, day two you do these extremes, and so basically nobody tried it. Say, what if I have seventy thousand records? If I try to import that in, especially knowing the limits, right? Like. People don't QA test anything. Oh, I, I, really? Yeah. You think they have a QA tester for this Excel import thing? It was probably the IT. Yeah, nobody tested it. Yeah, nobody, nobody tested, tested it. A um, few more updates here. Client Hub has introduced what they're calling frictionless workflow. Basically, you know, Client Flow is a practice management tool that has started out as a way to interact with your clients, to give them tasks, a portal, advanced portal kind of stuff going on there. I'm vastly simplifying it, but that's how I, <laughs> I see it. Um, now you can use Client Hub to manage the work inside of your firm too, the internal stuff that you don't necessarily want clients to see. So you can add one-time recurring jobs to manage day-to-day workflow, and each job can contain tasks and task details to provide staff with step-by-step instructions for completing the work. So you've got both the client side that they can see, and you've got the internal side. So that's really neat to see that going. And um, congrats to Judy McCarthy, who is, is running Client Hub. Did you see that Google rebranded G Suite to Google Workspace? So didn't they just rebrand G Suite from something else like a few years ago? 
it will used to be Google Apps. Maybe it was called that, yeah. It was called Google, Google, Apps. Google Apps. Then they called it G Suite, and now they're calling it what? Workspace. Google Workspace. And it's to provide a more integrated experience. And, and ultimately, it's to take on Microsoft Office and Microsoft Teams. But if you really look at like the kind of some of the feature sets they're adding because of this combining everything under one umbrella, I don't think it's Microsoft Teams. It's Slack. I think Microsoft and Google are coming hard at Slack. So one of the features they've, they've created, so if you're in the Google Workspace, so you and I are in there and we have a chat window and we're chatting and I spin up a Google Doc because like you and I are like, oh, let's start a doc about that. Boom. We both instantly got added to that doc. We don't have to like later on go and share it individually. And then anybody else that gets invited to that group or that chat also gets added to the, the same doc. So th this is an attack, I think, really like getting you to get your communications moved out of Slack into Teams and, and Google because you have all these other collaboration that you can't get inside of Slack. I think you're right. I think uh, Slack is super vulnerable right now because like what it is fundamentally is not that hard for Google and Microsoft to copy, as you see with Teams. One thing that Google did that made a big change in my life was with uh, Google Docs now, when you get a notification of an update, it's a, it's a dynamic email if you're using Gmail. So I can see that you made a comment in my doc and I can see what you commented on, David. And then I have the option to click into a little reply and reply in that email. I'm not actually sending an email, I'm interacting with the document in a limited view. And then if you reply to me, it doesn't send me a new email necessarily. It just updates that email I've already got there, like if it's still in my inbox. Interesting. And it's it's super powerful. And that's the sort of thing where, like the thing I hate about Slack is that it's not in my inbox. It's not email. So it's yet another place I have to go look. So if Google can fix this whole notifications thing and somehow get this like chat combined with email in a way that works, and I'm saying not saying that's easy, it's challenging. But if they can do that, it'll be superior for sure. Absolutely. Like we'll be better than Slack. Because I find Slack like in big companies where people are using Slack like crazy, I completely find it overwhelming. I hate it. So Slack is my is a new inbox. I just I used used to have 300 emails and the number would never go down. Yeah. And now I just have red dots with numbers that are ridiculous. Yeah. And oh, you God. can't keep up on Slack. <laughs> it's the worst. Um so remember the Japanese accounting app free F R E E E? With three E's? We talked about this a long time ago. Possibly. So, possibly. Uh, this is back when there was that whole trend of localized, not localized, but just local accounting apps starting up in countries where they have very specific requirements for accounting software and doing really well. So free is a cloud-based accounting app that apparently went public on the Tokyo Stock Exchange back in December. So they're, they're public in Japan. And it's just for the Japanese market. They have soared since COVID to a valuation of $3.7 billion. They have 220,000 subscribers. They've had 50% plus annual growth over the last five years. And sales are up 53% in the year ended June 30th. And this was a story in Yahoo Finance uh, highlighting them as a success story of the COVID economy. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel like 50% annual growth isn't that great for a SaaS company, like that we would normally expect, you know, doubling or tripling here in the US. But I think in the Japanese economy, that's actually like pretty great, right? Like really spectacular growth for a cloud-based app. And so it's interesting to see this happening in other countries, which, you know, we, you know, we're very US focused or tend to be, you know, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand focused. And it's neat to see this happening elsewhere in the world too. Intuit tried to take QuickBooks to Japan circa 1999. And I'll try to see if I can find, uh, you know, they skinned buses and, Intuit had its own like, you know, like I'm not going to use, I'm going to say the word Hello Kitty, but it's not Hello Kitty, but like, <laughs> they created you, you know character? that, like those characters, yeah. right. That you see in a lot of times, like in Japanese, um, advertisements. Yeah, and yeah, things. Yeah. So there was like this character and it's on the buses. I'll, I'll see if I can. Oh, you have I'll to find a picture of that. I, and I'll put it as the artwork if I can find it. I'm going to have to dig I'm going to have to dig around a lot. What, like QuickBooks Kitty? Drives or something. <laughs> it was something. It, it was like a, a, an animal of some type. But uh, yeah, there was very, yeah. Intuit tried to push QuickBooks desktop there a long amazing. time ago. So Square has purchased $50 million in Bitcoin and that caused their stock to go up for some reason. They have bought about uh, 4,709 Bitcoins, and it amounts to roughly 1% of Square's total assets as of the second quarter, according to a release. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square, 
Uh, actually, this was the CFO of Square said, quote, we believe that Bitcoin has the potential to be more ubiquitous currency in the future, unquote. And Square, by the way, was one of the first mainstream companies to become involved with Bitcoin several years back when it began letting cash app users buy and sell cryptocurrency, which you can still do, by the way. So if you if you haven't ever bought a Bitcoin and you want to, you just download the cash app and they make it easy. But you know what app was actually first? Oh, what? I think Expensify. Oh, they did it first? Yeah, I think Expensify, where you were able to get reimbursed back into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Expensify early on was uh, all over uh, That's great. Uh, Bitcoin back in the day. So, you know, big companies, I mean, Microsoft, these huge companies just have all this cash and they got to manage this cash and get a return on their investment, right? And they have mm -hmm. to diversify and, and, and spread out risk, right? Is this just a way for, if Square's involved in lots and lots and lots and lots of countries, and obviously, they're holding lots and lots and lots and lots of currency in different countries. Is this just a way to kind of spread out that risk to where, okay, hey, we're going to have just 1% of our assets also in this Bitcoin thing, just over here on the side, just in case. So we have some stability that works across all markets. I mean, maybe that's it. But I, th I think given that they um, they probably have a significant volume of cryptocurrency going through that cash app. And so having the currency on their balance sheet allows them to like hedge the exchange that way too. I, I mean, maybe they can actually make money on this somehow. Well, yeah, I could see that because that's how the cooks made all the money in on, in oil, right? They basically bought all like oil refineries and they they bought the pipelines and they could track how much oil was moving and that's how they were able to figure out all the oil futures stuff. You said the cooks, the right? uh, the. Coke brothers, sorry. The oh, Coke brothers. sorry. Yeah. I was really confused. I, I say I, I do say Cook because I right back in the day there were some kids that played uh, roller hockey used to coach, uh -huh. and it was it was spelled the same way, but they pronounce it Cook. Oh, so Coke, always, the Coke brothers. Yeah, the Got Coke it. Brothers, the Coke okay. brothers. Just the Coke brothers. They basically bought all the pipes along the way, and that's how they could figure out the future price of oil. And they made tons uh, of money on it. So I wonder if you're right because they know what kind of volumes going through their cash app regarding Bitcoin. They're making some hedges. So I got one story to take us out. Yep. Big, big four. So Ernst and Young oh, has changed the show. <laughs> yeah. Ernst and Young has changed its vacation policy. So Ernst and Young is the latest big company to embrace something that I think the rest of us have started to dislike now that we've been doing it for a while. They're a little behind. Uh, they're, they're flip, fl they're switching to unlimited PTO. So, which is funny to me considering that like people at the big four, try to take as little vacation as possible <laughs> because, you know, they, they feel like they can't. And so what happens is when you leave, you end up having this insane accrual for PTO that you get paid out. It's kind of a nice little bonus as you, as you exit. Well, one of the perks for EY is that now they don't have to pay out that accrued PTO because it's unlimited PTO, right? This is always one of the uh, nice like side benefits of having an unlimited PTO policy as a, as a company is that people actually end up taking less PTO. And then, oh, by the way, you don't have an accrual that you have to worry about anymore. Ah. Except in the states where that practice is illegal, then you'll still accrue PTO. But yeah, it's funny. There was a story on Going Concern that's really, it's worth reading because uh, they, they got a bunch of emails, internal emails. Because there's always like pissed off employees who, you know, forward these internal emails uh, to Going Concern. Yeah. And it's got all the talking points and like the reason for doing this. And, uh, you know, I mean, like the, the, the HR departments really are like evil cat Bert kind of organizations in the big four. And so it's, it's funny to read. They're like, okay, the real reason guys that we're doing this is this, but what we're going to tell the employees is this, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of, <laughs> and they're putting this in an email. Just thought that was funny. So just be glad that, uh, you know, if you're listening and you don't work for Ernst Young, just be happy. And that's it. That's all I got. Take us out with a, a depressing big four story. So uh, if you want to give us a call and let, let us know what you think about any of these stories or break a story or tell us about that Georgia Department of Revenue thing where we want to know what app it is, you can give us a call. That number is 202-695-1040. 202-695-1040. It goes straight to voicemail. It's got a three-minute limit, and so leave us a nice snappy message, and we'll take a listen, and we will likely even play it on the air. Yeah, and for those of you, if you have nothing to do on October 20th, we'd love for you to join us at the Accounting and Finance Show. We're going to be doing a keynote. Just search for Accounting and Finance Show. It's online this year, so you can join us from anywhere. We're going to do a live keynote, and uh, you can join us virtually. Uh, we're going to be doing a survey and talking about the results. And it'll just be fun. You can ask us questions live. 
Blake, if you want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? I am at Blake T. Oliver. How about you, David? I'm at David Leary. You can do that on Twitter and then LinkedIn the same. If you're LinkedIn, please just say you're not a bot so I know who you are when you friend me up. It's not friend me up. What, what is it on LinkedIn? Connect. Connect. Connect me up. Until next week when we connect again, I'm not a bot. Bye, everybody. Time for the classifieds. I want to tell you about a new workflow solution called Baco Tech. Baco Tech is a cloud solution that puts CPAs in the middle of their clients' data. Baco Tech gathers clients' data and delivers it to CPAs in real time through one login, enabling CPAs to make adjustments to tax returns and client accounting issues as they happen, not at for year end. Baco Tech helps CPAs provide their clients with the proactive services they need and increases the firm's efficiency and leads to working less overtime and busy season. To learn more about Baco Tech, head over to bacotech.com. Looking to radically increase productivity as a cloud accountant? Introducing Client Hub's Frictionless Workflow, a unique combination of internal workflow seamlessly blended with client tasks and communications. See how a frictionless experience across your team and your clients will save you hours of time. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app. Enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, truly frictionless workflow. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.